Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah from verse number 78. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And there are amongst them ummiyun, unlettered people, who do not know the book, but they trust upon amaniyya, false desires or false hopes, and they rely on guesswork or assumptions. Then woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah to purchase with it a little price. Woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for what they have earned thereby. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we were continuing from the previous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses, before these verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, is describing the reaction of some of Bani Israel to the prophethood of Musa alayhi salam at his time and other messengers, how they reacted, how they took the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how they obeyed or disobeyed the messengers that were sent to them. And in this line, these verses continue. Last week we, or the week before that, we discussed where some of the elite some of the uh, more learned people would be hiding or changing some of the words of the revelation. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is turning our focus and attention to the unlettered people, to the masses, to the common people amongst them. And this is the thing about, you know, the Qur'an is sent as a guide. The Qur'an, any wahi, revelation, is sent as a guide so that we read it, understand it, learn it, and implement it. This is the whole focus, purpose of the Qur'an, of all revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to all his messengers. If we don't understand it, if we read it without understanding, or we understand it and we don't implement, then this is something blameworthy. This is something that goes against the whole purpose of the Qur'an, the whole purpose of wahi, revelation, the whole purpose of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This goes completely against the whole purpose of the Qur'an if people do not understand what is in the book, if people change what is in the book, if people do not implement after understanding, they don't implement or follow in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, then it goes completely against the guidance, against the purpose of the whole book, the reason why this has been sent to us. So these two verses are very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with that وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ وَمِنْهُمْ From amongst them. Who are they? Ahlul Kitab. The people of the book. Uh, Bani Israel. From amongst them. وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ There are unlettered people. Ummiyun is plural of Ummi. Ummi comes from the word Umm, mother. Ummiyun or Ummi is someone who cannot read or write. It refers to someone who cannot read or write. What's the connection with mother? It's as though the day you were born from your mother's womb, can you read or write? The day you're born? No. So Ummi is like the na your nature the day you were born. You couldn't read or write. You're illiterate. Basically means to be illiterate not have the capacity to read or write. This is what it means. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّةِ From amongst them are unlettered common folk, from amongst them, who do not know the book, except, and we'll come in to discuss what amaniyya means, except amaniyya, we'll discuss what that means. But Ummi itself is not a bad thing. Ummi, being illiterate, just by itself, is not a bad thing. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's described as being Ummi. The nation, the Arab nation, they're also described as being Ummiyin. They're also unlettered, the majority of them. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says um, in the Qur'an, about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُهُ بِيَمِينِكِ إِذَا لَرْتَابَ الْمُطِّلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, in Surah 29 verse 48, 
neither did you, referring to Muhammad وسلم, read any book before it, before this Quran, nor did you write any book with your right hand. In that case, indeed, the followers of falsehood might have doubted. So here, the, the Quran is very clearly saying that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he was not, he did not read any books before the Quran was revealed. Neither was he able to write any books. And the wisdom behind that of, of giving wahi, revelation, the final revelation, giving this to a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who could not read or write, the wisdom behind it, one of the wisdom, there's many, one of them is that if he was able to read and write, the kuffar or the, or the mushrikun of the Quraysh would have had an easy rebuttal. They would have said, oh, this Quran is not from Allah. It's not Jibreel alayhi salam bringing this Quran. This is something Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, he wrote himself. Or, as many uh, people of other faiths claim today, this is something he's read from the Bible, from, from the Torah, from other books, other scriptures, and he simply copied it and, and brought it into the Quran. This is what the Quran said. Allah said that you were not someone who could read or write. If you had been someone who was literate, they would have said that this, they would have doubted those who are uh, leaders of falsehood, they would have doubted in the authenticity of the Quran. So this is a miracle as well. This is part of the miracle of the Quran that it came to a prophet وسلم, who could not read or write. So it's impossible that he could have written this Quran. And it's impossible if he could not read, then he couldn't have taken these things, these passages, these ayahs, these stories from other scriptures. So Ummi, being Ummi doesn't mean something bad or negative in of itself. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, Inna ummatun ummiyatun la naktubu wa la nahsibu. The Prophet وسلم, said, we are an Ummi nation, meaning we don't, most of our people, the Arabs of the time, we are illiterate, we don't read or write. Neither writing or calculating. The lunar month is like this and this and this. You know, this is a hadith about how to uh, calculate the lunar months. But here also the Prophet وسلم, is describing the, the, the Arab nation at that time, his people, as ummi, illiterate. Don't misunderstand this hadith that it's good to be illiterate. No, he's just describing his people at the time. Of course, even at the time of the Prophet وسلم, he, during his lifetime, he encouraged and promoted and strongly advocated for people to learn how to read and write. And obviously the Islamic civilization, the whole history of Islam, is about um, at the head of, of the golden era of Islam, at, at, is about intellectual um, superiority as well in, in reading and writing, in studying, in writing books, in explanation, in, in theories, in sciences. So no way is it encouraged to remain illiterate. The Prophet some he could not read or write, that was for a specific purpose. Because to, to remove the doubts that this is from the Prophet himself. And it's also part of the miracle of the Quran. That this book that is so complex, that is so beautiful, is the highest standard in Arabic language. It has deep meaning, it has guidance. This is coming all at the hands of a messenger who couldn't read or write. So this is part of the miracle of the Quran as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also clearly says, هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is he who sent amongst the Ummiyin, meaning the Arabs, ones, uh, a messenger from amongst them, from amongst themselves. So again, he's reasserting this idea that the Arabs at the time were also described as Ummi. But here, this is a blameworthy characteristic. In this verse, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّةِ This is a blameworthy characteristic. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that the ummi is someone who is incapable of two things, reading and writing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that amongst them, Ahlul Kitab or Bani Israel, 
there are amongst them who, people who do not read or write. And therefore, they have no direct understanding of the book, of their book. لا يعلمون الكتاب They don't know what's in their book. They don't know the meaning of their book. Even if some of them have memorized their book or passages from their book, but they don't know the meanings. They don't understand what's in the book. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that إلا أمانية They don't know of the book except amaniya. Amaniya comes from a word which means like to have false hopes. To have false hopes. Like tamanna, when you wish or desire something which is almost impossible to get, get or acquire. Like you want to enter paradise without doing any good works. This is like, you know, from, from aman. This is like wishful thinking. This is like wishful thinking. You desire this, but it's almost impossible. You can't make it happen. You can't do that. You can't go into paradise, Jannah, without doing any good works. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes these people who are ummi, illiterate, do not read or write, cannot understand the book. They know nothing of the book except vain, hopeful, wishful desires. It's whatever they think is correct. Yes. This is what must be in the book. Or it also means um, hearsay, meaning whatever they heard their teachers or scholars say this is in the book, this is in the Torah, this is in the Injil or whatever scripture they have, they trust them and they believe that is correct, even if they are giving them the wrong information. So these people who are completely stuck they can neither access the book themselves, nor can they distinguish when their scholars are telling them something wrong. They don't know how to check it. They don't have access to the books themselves. Also, amongst them, they believe things which are not true. They believe that to be true and part of the book. So these people are completely oblivious. They're far away from the truth. They're far away from the book. They're far away from the meaning in the book and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted as guidance from them. وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms further وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ And they only guess or assume ظن They only assume or guess what is in the book because they haven't read it themselves. They don't have understanding of what's in the book. They have no knowledge of what's in the book because they don't read or write. They have no direct access. So they only assume what is in the book. Some of them make up something and say this is in the book. Others believe what their teachers or what their imams or what their uh, scholars are telling them and they accept it without any um, checking because they don't have the means to check. So Allah is telling us here that in this verse, you know, وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ They only assume or guess. And other mufassirun, they said, يَكْذِبُونَ Because when you start guessing what's in the book, you, you start assuming what's in the book, you will start also lying. Ultimately, when you assume and guess what is in the Qur'an, what is in this book, you will be ending up lying against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you're not allowed in Sharia, you can't guess what is the answer to this question? You know, is this halal or haram, brother? You can't guess. You have to have the knowledge. You have to go and refer to the scholars. Or the scholars have to refer to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It can't be just assumptions and guesswork. Is this, will this make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy? Will this make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala angry? It can't be based on my guesswork. I have to have knowledge. I have to base it on the Qur'an. I have to base it on the sunnah. I have to base it on, the, on what the scholars say, who have interpreted the texts. It can't be guesswork, it can't be assumption. If I guess, if I assume, then I am lying against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I'm saying Allah said this is halal, or Allah said this is haram, or Allah said this is what makes Allah happy, or this is pleasing to Allah. If I'm saying this out of guesswork, I'm going to get things wrong. And that in effect is lying against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why some of the mufassirun, they, they interpreted this as 
wa inhum illa yadhunnun they only guess and assume it means they only lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another meaning of amaniya wa inhum uh, illa amaniya another meaning of this word wishful thinking is there you know wanting something that isn't is very difficult to attain is there but it also means another meaning is tilawa amaniya also means tilawa la ya'lamuna al-kitaba illa amaniya they do not know the book except amaniya also one of the opinions is it means they do not know the book except the recitation of the book except the tilawa of the book they can read it but they don't know what it means right this is another meaning they have no clue what's in the book now these verses of surah al-baqarah we said in the beginning that surah al-baqarah is dealing with a couple of themes a couple of issues one of the issues is about this change in leadership from ahlul kitab from the people of the book you know the leadership of guidance of humanity the leadership of receiving uh, the message from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the messengers alayhim assalam and being guardians of the revelation and to invite others the rest of humanity and to guide them this leadership position is being transferred with the advent of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so surah baqarah is also about this change in leadership that the leadership has gone from ahlul kitab has now come to ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as part of that change allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also informing us where the previous nations went wrong where some of the previous nations where they made mistakes where why did they lose this leadership how did they lose this leadership what was the characteristics or behavior or actions of those people who lost this leadership and these some of these ayahs are discussing exactly that now who is it a lesson for it's a lesson for us because we have been given this leadership the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been given this big responsibility of the quran of the final messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam of the final message to preserve it to understand it to act by it to invite others to teach others and to call others this big responsibility has now been given to ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam now the lesson for us here is that their illiterate people people who cannot read or write who don't understand the book they are being censured criticized they are being blamed here the lessons are aimed for us can we relate to this of course is the same happening with the muslims yes of course are there muslims who do who do not understand what's in the book many muslims don't know what's in the book many muslims don't know what's in the quran many muslims most muslims learn how to read the quran because of this system we have which is good that from a young age everyone has to learn the arabic alphabets they have to learn at least how to read the quran fine that's positive that's good but most people do not understand the quran most people don't know what's in the quran most people don't know what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal and made haram most people don't know what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about as priorities for muslims most people don't know what the quran is focusing on most people don't know what the contents of each surah is so our muslim ummah our community also falls into this mistake there are many amongst us who are illiterate when it comes to the quran who are illiterate when it comes to sharia who are illiterate when it comes to islam the 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 biggest one of the biggest problem of the muslim community is the islamic literacy islamic literacy of the of the muslim community you know in, in terms of education nations are measured by the rate of literacy so if an if a country has you know 80% 90% literacy it means 80 or 90% of that population can read or write therefore they can learn they can study they can become doctors engineers and 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 whatever 
they can advance, they can develop, there are, you know, they can produce things. When a country has a low level of literacy, they'll say this country only has 20% literacy. Usually this country is behind economically, socially, politically, every, every which way you can think of, usually these countries are behind. Similarly, we have to think about Islam, Sharia, Quran with this Islamic literacy. Most Muslims today are literate, they can read and write, whichever languages they speak. But when it comes to Islam, our liter Islamic literacy rate is really low, all throughout, except for here and there, among certain people, among certain, maybe even certain populations. But generally speaking, our Islamic literacy, what do I mean by Islamic literacy? The common person, the common man or woman, their level of understanding of this deen, their level of understanding of the Qur'an, their level of understanding of basics of the deen. I'm not talking about everybody has to become a scholar. It's not about everybody has to learn the Arabic language and study usul of fiqh and fiqh and tafsir and hadith. No, I'm talking about basic Islamic literacy, which means that every Muslim should know their fard, obligations. Every Muslim should know how to pray. Every Muslim should know the basic contents of the Quran. Every Muslim should know the basic pillars of Iman, of Islam, the basics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says his Rahman, his Rahim, you know, his names, his sifat. What does he want from us? What, is, what, is, what are our priorities in this life? You know, the basics of Islam where somebody can be guided to fulfill their role as Muslims. This is what I mean by Islamic literacy. This is so important and this is missing in our communities. So the lesson for us is that, yes, this is something criticized, this is something blameworthy in these verses of the Quran relating to Ahlul Kitab, but it's also a big lesson for us. That if we also fit this description, what does it say about us? There are many Muslims, most Muslims don't know. So if, if a scholar says on TV or in a gathering to, to, to the masses or population or, or group of Muslims, they can make anything up and only a few people will, able to, will be able to challenge this scholar or imam or speaker or holy person and say, no, that's wrong, that's not correct. Only a few people will be able to correct them. The rest will just follow whatever he or she is saying. And we fit into this category. They don't know much of the book. They don't know any of the book. They don't know the meaning of the book, except their own false desires, whatever wishful thinking they have. And many people fall into this. And there's two categories very quickly. One is the general population and the way most of the general population falls into this trap is because they never ever pick up a translation of the Qur'an. They never study the deen. They never pick up a book, even translations of hadith, of fiqh, of basics of iman. They don't bother to study. Many people are just Muslim by identity. I've born a Muslim. I pray here and there sometimes. Maybe I fast. But that's it. I never ever study the deen. Many Muslims like that. They don't know anything, they don't know much about the deen. Islamically illiterate. So this is the masses. Then you have the activists and the du'at, or even those who are active for social justice, or charity work, or some other campaign, or, or, or getting Muslim rights, etc. There's a problem there as well. Same problem. You can be... Alhamdulillah, a lot of activists are doing great work. You know, we have so many organizations, we have so many charities, we have campaigning organizations, lobbying organizations, dawah organizations, uh, institutes and everything. But again, even at this second tier, there can be problems. If we are not doing things according to the book, according to the sunnah, according to sharia, according to Islam, if my program of social change if my program of fighting Islamophobia, if my program of fighting oppression and discrimination or bringing about change in the community or facing 
uh, racism or whatever it may be, if my program is simply based on my emotions, my reactions, what I think is priority, what I think is a good method, what I think is a good way, a system, a framework, if it's just based on my thinking and I don't check with the Qur'an, I don't, I don't have the ability to check with the Qur'an, or I don't check with the scholars, I don't check with Sharia, is this, you know, is it compatible with Islam? Is this what Sharia tells me to do? Or does Sharia tell me to do it slightly differently? The methods I'm employing to bring about change, to fight for Muslim rights, to do, bring about social justice, or even charity work, am I doing it in accordance to Sharia? There can be problems there as well. And we've seen this many, many times, where people are not knowing what the guidance on that particular issue or that area of work is from the Sharia. And they're also doing things from their own kind of conjecture or assumptions and things like that. So these are the two levels, if you like, that we need to concentrate on and, and, and bring changes. But the main, main change that needs to come has to be at the mass level. The, the, the du'at, the activists, at least they have some grounding, they have some knowledge. They just need to check more regularly, improve their knowledge, etc. We all have to improve our knowledge. We all have to study, it's a continuous thing. But, you know, at least they know the basics. But the masses, the common people, the public, the population, you know, there's so many Muslims who are simply Islamically illiterate. And this is where we have to encourage people to, to study the basics of their deed. We have to encourage people not to rely on just what this Imam has said or this uh, pious person has said or this peer has said or whatever. People have to start learning, educating themselves. There's no excuse for ignorance. And this is what, what is keeping this Ummah behind at the moment. There has to be a massive effort, a massive da'wah to increase Islamic literacy. This must be a, a priority across the Ummah. Alhamdulillah, many people are engaged in this, but this is the situation, this is the state that we're in. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on. He says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا then woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from Allah, to purchase with it a little price. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues that there's another group of people amongst the Ahlul Kitab, amongst Bani Israel, who simply, you know, write the book with their own hands. They change what's in the book or write something new and then say, this is from Allah, this is from the book. This is revelation. This has been sent by Allah. This is what I found in the scriptures, our holy books or revelation. Why do they do this? Usually it's to purchase with it a little price, meaning in exchange for some worldly benefit, in exchange for some worldly gain, something small. No matter how much you pay someone for a fatwa or for someone to interpret something in the wrong way, or, or no matter how much someone earns by selling or, or misrepresenting the deen, even if they're paid billions of pounds, it's a small price compared to what they have sold. Compared to what they have sold. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the word wail, فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ It means, may they be destroyed, you know, destruction, and, and punishment on those who write the book with their own hands. And wail is also a cry of distress, you know. So some people said it's the word that will be uttered by those who are punished and it will be the cry of the disbelievers in the hellfire. And generally scholars said it means destruction or a painful punishment. So destruction and a painful punishment for those who write the book with their own hands and then they say, this is from Allah. Why do they do this? To sell for, for some worldly gain. This is why they do this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَوَيْلُ لَهُمْ مِمَّا كَتَبَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ Again, an emphasis and a repeat that therefore destruction 
and a painful punishment for those for what they have written with their own hands. And for what they have earned from selling those lies. So whatever they've written and for the money they've earned or worldly gain they've gained through misrepresenting the revelation or the book, may they be destroyed for that and may they be punished may they be punished for that so this is another important aspect what is the lesson there for us most people will say you know um, no muslim would ever change one letter of the quran uh, up to now i haven't heard of any muslim who has claimed that you know who has changed a word or a letter of the quran and said you know, this is from Allah. No one's going to do that, right? Most Muslims will not do that. Most Muslims are not foolish to even attempt that. The Quran is preserved. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we have sent down the dhikr and we will uh, preserve it. وَنَحْنُ لَهُ حَافِذُونَ لَحَافِذُونَ That we will preserve the dhikr, the reminder, the Quran, we have sent down and we are those who will preserve it and protect it from any change. So A, no, nobody will attempt it. B, the Quran is completely protected from any change. So even if someone did attempt it, it will make no difference because the Quran is preserved both in memory through isnad and in writing, both in memory, you know, the chain from whoever knows, memorize the Qur'an from their teacher all the way, from their teachers all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. And this is mutawatiran, meaning there's so many thousands and thousands in every generation who have memorized the Qur'an all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ, as it was revealed. And secondly, it's also preserved in the writing, in the mushaf, you know, the copies that we have that are certified as the Qur'an, these are preserved as a whole. So in these two manners, the Qur'an is protected, it's preserved, no one can change it. But what people do as a lesson for Muslims, because this is talking about, these ayahs are talking about those people who actually change their books, for real, with words and, and passages and chapters. And this isn't a anti-Christian uh, thing or anti-Jewish thing, no, not at all. The scholars of Christianity, the scholars of Judaism and their texts, the vast majority of the, I, you know, they will admit very openly and clearly that a lot of their original texts, um, different sections, different books, have gone undergone a process of change throughout the ages. This is without any doubt. There's no doubt on that, and, and nobody really denies that. So this isn't anything anti this religion or anti that religion. But the lessons for the Muslims is that there's nobody who will change the Qur'an, nobody who will change a verse or a surah. However, there are people who, in the guise of scholarship, in the guise of academia, in the guise of be belonging to a think tank or being an intellectual, there are people who are willing to change the Sharia, who are willing to change the rules that are found in the Qur'an who are willing to change the rules that are found in the Sunnah by saying that this rule doesn't exist in the Qur'an or, by say, or misinterpreting this text. Oh, that was revealed for the Prophet at his time. No longer valid, no longer relevant. It's been abrogated or it doesn't apply anymore. Or the scholars got it wrong, they didn't understand X, Y, and Z. Or whatever. Many, many different ways there are people whether they claim to be academics or belonging to think tanks or even claiming to be scholars or researchers or writers who will employ different tactics to try and change what is in the Sharia, what is in Islam. Now, I don't mean changing, you know, it, we have to understand in Sharia, in Islam, there are those things which are fixed. You cannot change. Right? Those things which are fixed, you can't change. The rules of certain things are fixed. Like five times a day prayer. Can anybody change this? No. They can't make it three times a day or two times a day. Like alcohol being haram. This can never be changed. 
There are many things in the deen which are fixed, established, proven by clear texts, or agreed upon that these are fundamentals of the deen, they cannot be changed. There are other things which may undergo some change, some rules, regulations, some fiqh, which can change according to circumstances, time and place. But we're talking about those things which are fixed that cannot be changed. There are so-called Muslims who will claim that these have been changed, or these no longer exist, or these are not really part of Islam. And especially in the West, a lot of this is happening. Due to different reasons, the individuals who do this, either they could be convinced they're right, so it could be due to ignorance, or more often, which is the case, is that they are selling, like these verses, they are saying this is the truth, to exchange it for some kind of worldly benefit. Either to advance their career, either to sell a book, either for their position, or they're working in collusion with certain groups. So they willingly, knowingly, will change aspects of the deen, which is fixed and cannot be changed, and say, this is what Islam says on X, Y, and Z. But in actual fact, they have changed those things which cannot be changed. And, and similarly, they are doing it for worldly benefit, mostly. It could be somebody sincere made a mistake, that's different. Could be somebody is ignorant, they, they don't understand the text, that's different. But there are, and Muslims need to be aware of that. But again, if the public are mainly illiterate, how will they know that? How will they know this? How will they be aware and alive to this happening? So we have problems on both ends. One is a lot of our public are not aware, don't have the Islamic literacy to know which things, or to even um, be aware when somebody is talking against Islam, something that doesn't, you know, something, somebody is trying to change a pillar of Islam or something that cannot be changed, somebody is trying to change it. If I don't have the knowledge, I won't be able to even notice when that's happening. So we have this problem in these verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very strongly condemning those who change the verses and then says from Allah, we know the Muslims won't do this, but we have to be aware of those who change aspects of the Sharia, which is based on the Quran and Sunnah, based on you know Ijma and the Sahaba and, and, and the sayings of the scholars. There are people who would like to change this, and there are people who have written on different aspects who want to change it. So we have to be careful. We have to know our Deen. We have to know those things which cannot be changed. And we have to know those things where there's room for flexibility, for different opinions, and maybe sometimes even change. We have to be aware of But the only way we will know this is if we increase our Islamic literacy. If we ourselves are able to access the basics of our deen, if we ourselves are engaged in learning, in learning the Qur'an, in learning the Sunnah, in learning fiqh, in learning aqidah, in iman, and things like that, that's the only way we will be able to notice or point out when somebody is trying to change something. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. Um, hopefully, in summary, what these two verses, in terms of lessons for us, is about Islamic literacy. We have to stop being ummi when it comes to Islamic knowledge, when it comes to the deen, when it comes to the Qur'an and sunnah. We have to be on a journey of learning and we have to raise the level of our ummah when it comes to Islamic literacy. This is very important. We can start by ourselves, by enrolling on courses, by taking up reading, by studying ourselves at home, or nowadays on social media videos, there's lots of programs, or through satellite TV or channels. There's many, many means of learning. Every Muslim should be engaged in some form of learning. Doesn't mean everybody has to do a degree in Sharia or become an expert in Qur'an. No, I'm talking about learning the basics, the foundations of our deen. So enough by which you can observe, practice this deen accurately, correctly, and where you know what is right or wrong in the deen. This is the level we should all try to achieve for ourselves, our families, our relatives, our friends. We should encourage this and promote this. And secondly, the dangers of trying to change 
anything in the deen. No Muslim will change any verses, as we've said, or any surahs of the Qur'an. But there are certain individuals who want to change some of the foundations of the deen, some of the things that we're not allowed to change. And we have to be alert to that. But the only way we will be alert to that is if we know ourselves. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to increase our Islamic literacy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect this ummah from those that try to change the fundamentals of the deen. And we know the deen is protected inshallah. But you know, if the literacy goes down like the Prophet pre uh, predicted and foretold that the ulama will be really less towards the end of time, those who know the deen. So people will come up who will be misguided and they will misguide others. So we must be alert to this and we must work against that by, by learning ourselves, by teaching, by implementing, by learning and, and reading and acquiring knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq inshallah. We'll carry on with the following, uh, the next verses next week inshallah.